every commercial investment project is financed. So we're going to talk about the returns that people want when they invest in real estate. We'll talk about real estate as an investment, and we'll talk about how the capital markets work. Okay. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, so I took that picture yesterday. Haha. Uh -huh. um, maybe that was 30 years ago. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Is there people on that did our enter? So I was making sure that there. Oh, okay. So don't forget. Okay. So my background, I graduated here in 1986. Um, I went to go work in the real estate business. I was a broker. I was a and note job. He's making 200 phone calls a day. He's up to two. He's starting a brokerage business. Um, I went back uh, and got my MBA here as well in 1994. Uh, so I, I'm both an undergraduate and graduate. The undergraduate was in marketing. The graduate was in finance. And then from there, I've done real estate finance ever since 1994. So um, in, uh, I worked for a large uh, investment bank uh, for a number of years. And in 1999, I left that and started my own company. Uh, there was no entrepreneurship program here. Uh, so I was my own, we were our own entrepreneur. And we started our own company. I was 34 years old. It was called Canover Financial. We raised uh, $3 billion of capital with private and pension funds. And we invested that capital uh, in real estate. We were private, uh, private and public pension fund investors of real estate. We were the experts. Okay, and we put that uh, in, into a lot of the things. Uh, 123 different projects over 18 years. So, so, so that is a very giant business of this business, the capital markets business. Um, in 2012, uh, we sold our uh, private equity firm, small private equity firm. Uh, we sold that, and I started building apartments, and that's what I've done for the last 12 years. Uh, we have apartments in Palms. Um, we have apartments in uh, Culver City, Mar Vista, um, uh, Denver, Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, it's kind of our two hubs in which we've built projects. Uh, we have about uh, we have one very large project. We have a 200 million dollar project in Encino. Um, we're building 238 senior care uh, units that have independent living, uh, memory care, and assisted living with an operator. Uh, so we are, or hopefully, I can get financing today. Um, uh, start construction on that in June. Uh, I'm under construction right now in a project in Culver City, um, and we're just about to start construction in two weeks on a project in Palm. So that's what, that's what I do. I build projects. Okay. Uh, I've actually been married. That needs to be updated. Uh, I've actually been married 34 years. That needs to be updated. Uh, my, my children are now 30 and 28. Uh, so that they're at least older. So that needs to be updated. Um, and uh, I grew up as a musician. I played in, uh, since I was around in the 80s, I was in the 80s ear bands and all those kinds of things. Did long hair and, 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 and well, I hide all the pictures because he put pictures up of me in my class on every one of his presentations. This is me off, he finds them uh, on the internet. I have to get all those down. Um, put out an album in 2015, way later after I stopped being. Um, so that's kind of what I do for fun. Um, I do music. I, I'm a worship director at a church as well in uh, in El Cigano. So I've done that as well. So that, that's me. All right. What is capital markets? Capital markets is the borrowing of money for getting investors to invest with that. I'm a developer. I need money to build projects. I have a $200 million project. I don't happen to have $200 million in the bank. So I need to go to a bank and investors to invest that. There's an entire business wrapped around capital markets. You know, there's brokers who sell houses, right? They're called intermediaries. They intermediate between the buyer and seller. There are finance intermediaries. They they intermediate between the developer and finance side. So I go to an intermediary. I may hire an intermediary and I say, go find me a construction loan. I pay him a fee for that. In fact, you get a fee for selling a house. Okay. And he'll take he'll take my project to his 25 banks and see if he can find the best finance for the owner. Okay. So owners and operators, we always have to find capital. If I build things, I need construction finance. Okay. If I have if I own property, I need short and long term financing. I need capital. We are a capital, massively capital intensive business. That's our business. 
we need a lot of capital. We need a lot of capital. Okay. Um, there's all kinds of things: short-term debt, long-term debt. Mezzanine loans are like a second on a property, like a mezzanine. You know, like a mezzanine of a sort of like a second floor of a, of a building. They call it the mezzanine. We call it mezzanine. It's just really a second on the property. Okay. You can put seconds and thirds, and you can put different priorities, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, joint venture. I have to have partners. I have to have guys who are my money partners playing like that. We'll talk about that. And then the providers of capital, banks, debt funds, private equity funds, that's what I was, that's Hanover. REITs, anyone know what a REIT is? What it stands for? That's exactly right. And what is that? Do you know? Uh, oh, God, don't say the word yet, please. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, at least like 100 years that's yeah, so what it is, it's an operating company that's publicly traded. They trade shares. So I can, you can go to the internet, you can go onto your Fidelity account, and you can buy shares in a REIT. That's how they raise their money. They raise their money from the public. So it's a real estate investing trust, trust where people put in their money and investors and uh, developers put it in projects for them to earn a return. Okay. And then high net worth investors. The project that we're just about to start construction, I have 51 high net worth investors in my in that deal that we raised $11 million from that. So these are people who are not real estate related, but they would like to invest in real estate. So we we raised money from we raised money from non-institutional people. And there's people who are doctors and dentists and lawyers and things like that who want to invest their money in real estate. But they can't buy a big building, but they can invest a little bit and we can we all those together, and I'll tell you why we need the money. Okay, the intermediaries they are the broker of money. Okay, see me, Richard Ellis, JLL, some big names if you've heard. They have departments that are the intermediaries. We use intermediaries because it's like it's like if I had a if I hired someone to go get money for me, I paid them a salary, right? I'll pay them higher than forty dollars. Okay, but I don't necessarily need capital three hundred sixty five days a year, so I just hire. A broker to go broker money, go find me a loan. Talk to 100 banks, 100 investors, that kind of thing. That's all they do. And that, they earn a fee for that. Some are very, very successful. Okay. So let's look at real estate as an investment. Now, I'm going to dumb this down real quick. So forgive me. Okay. But I'm going to dumb it down for a minute. Why do people invest in anything? Why do you invest in Apple stock? Why do you invest in anything? To make turn. What kind of return do you want? You know? The highest return you could get. That's exactly right. Okay. Now, does everything provide the highest return you can get? There's risk associated with that, correct? There's risk with that. Okay. So, someone on their computer, look up the 10 year treasury right now. If you want to buy a 10 year treasury, 10 year treasury. There's a rate. What is it today? So look it up. Should pop right up. Four point five. Four point one five. Four point one five percent. The government is offering four percent on your money if you invest in the government. The government takes your money and uses it. That's simple. Okay. This is this that simple. So. I think if you do this, I'm going to stub it down. Because when you get to real estate, everyone goes, huh? It's the same concept, but we call it all different things for some reason. But we're still good at class. The idea is that if I had terrible. If I had $100,000, I wanted to buy a U.S. Treasury, how much money would I make in one year? What's, what's the cash return of that? So I take 100,000 times 0.0415%. What does that equal? Can you get the calculator out? $4,150, right? So the government paid me $4,000 a year to use my $100,000, right? You buy a US Treasury bond. You're getting a whole lot than four thousand bucks a year for your, your thing. Now, is U.S. Treasury bonds risky? 
or not risky? Not risky what? Because <clears throat> the government's backing. Government what happens if the government doesn't have any money? What do they do? They just print more. So that's a pretty safe rate. You're pretty much going to earn that, right? Okay. Very good. I pull notes. I'm just down. Bear with me, fun. So we're going to go backwards. We're going to go backwards on this. A property generates four thousand one hundred and fifty dollars of income every year. The apartment building, rent, on its expenses, it generates income, right? Before debt, before you pay any debt, that, that just generates for that number. We'll see what that's called in a minute. This is just a called the return on your investment, annualized return on your investment. Okay, we call it net operating income. Companies call it EBITDA, right? Earnings before depreciation tax. Right, so a property generates that. I go to a broker and I tell a broker, Hey, I want to sell it. The broker says, What do you need four thousand dollars? I need to apply a risk to the risk of that, the risk of the state stability of that uh, stream of income. Right, so the concept of the stream of income for the government is you're going to get that four thousand dollars pretty much guaranteed, right. So, would the rate of return need to be higher or lower than the government? Higher, because it's more risky. Then it's used in the market. So, we'll get there in a minute. So, let's say that I wanted an 8% return because I know it's risky. What do I price my building to sell at? I don't figure that out. So, if I did, and this is all makes sense in a minute. So, if I did the investment amount times the rate of return equals, right, equals my NOI, so to speak, the way I figure this out is I divide this, just I click cross, and I'm going to open cross, then here, divide that by 0.08, what's 4150 divided by 0.08%? Okay. 51,000. So that means that if I want, sorry, I can't figure that out. Set up. 10% is only 41,000, right? So the concept is, is that I can list my property for 51,000 because I want to get 8% return on the money and generate $100 income. So that's how we value real estate. I know it sounds simple. This will get a little bit. Further up. Okay. I did that real quickly because we're going to go through this. All right. What did I do with my thing? All right. So everyone takes their money, their, their 51,000 says, I can buy stocks, I can buy bonds, I can buy treasuries, I can buy, I can, I can invest in the stock market, or I can invest in real estate. And I can invest in real estate. Real estate is just an avenue to invest in earning return on your money. Okay. That's all it is. Okay. Now, even when you talk about single family homes, the developers who build those homes, they sell it for a million, they build it for a million, sell it for a million two, they make a profit. Right? Simple. So every piece of real estate, literally other than schools and hospitals for the most part, are an investment. You need capital, there's returns on that investment. So almost every piece of property known to man generates income or sales income. That's someone wants to return on their investment. Now, take another simple, very simple example. All right, I'm feeling good. I like this. I'm going to invest in a, a real estate project. I'm going to invest in a real estate project. I have $10,000. At the end of the investment, I made $10,000. It's all my money. Pretty good, right? Double my money. I got 20,000 bucks. Right? Simple, simple, simple. If it took me one year, my annualized return. It took me one year. 100%, right? My annualized return. I got it day one. I got it day 365 in one year. That's 100% return. What if it took five years? 
hundred percent. Right? Everyone know how I got that? I just took a hundred percent rather than a hundred. It was my annualized return for twenty percent. Gee, what happens if it took ten years to get the money back? I made ten percent. Simple, right? So, real estate capital markets is all about what returns we get over the period of time in which your money's out and your money comes back. That's it. Okay? And everybody looks for a specific return based upon the risk of a particular investment. Okay? All right. I'm not going to go read all this. All right. So, there's your pot, there's a small pot. Okay. Everyone heard of uh, the fireman's pension fund where people put in the pension funds or the teacher's pension fund and those kinds of things. Okay. They have investment strategies because they take all the money that they get from the pension of all their employees, they pull it together and they invest it. That's it. With the hope is that they grow that portfolio, get returns of that portfolio, because people are getting older and older and older and they're living on it. So if you were a fireman, Number of years, you get 90% of your salary when you retire, and then it's a lot. That's the point. We'll be able to hold your future. Not right, it's just tough. Okay, so every teacher's union uh, in New York and every state, every public thing, they take capital and they do a pie chart. They won't put it in our collectibles. Don't give it away. I just put that for you. Kind of but they'll do stocks, bonds, real estate with the, with the hope of the billions of dollars they collect from all their people. That grows so they continue to pay out benefits. Those are my investors. So they give me money, they give stock guys money, they buy bonds, and so but I'm the real estate expert. I'm the one who invests in real estate because I know what I'm doing. Hopefully, right? So in, in the business of real estate capital markets, there are investors. So Goldman Sachs, Aries, all of the major investment banks, they take that money, they invest it in a variety of things venture capital. Right, so let's get the pension fund. Look at capital, look at real estate, stocks, whatever. Real estate is just an investment vehicle in the capital markets world. Okay. Now, the concept is that I need to gauge the risk of real estate relative. So I'm an investor. I can buy stocks, I can buy bonds, I can buy real estate, and I need to gauge the risk return. Right, so it's more risky than treasury, so I should get a better return than that. Right. Maybe less risky than crypto, right? So if you're getting less returns in crypto, I need to measure that return. Okay, I need to measure that annualized return, and the, <laughs> the industry sets it. Okay, the industry sets it. So when you talk about a money market fund, low risk, relatively low return, treasuries, relatively low risk, low return, all we have to set the stock on that's a tech stock or stock or very volatile. So the idea of risk return is the volatility of the income that you generate from your investment. I know it's not surprised, I know it's not value, but I know. So the concept is that there's just a risk return spectrum. That's all it is. Lowest is treasury bills, highest is president, and then crypto is off the charts, and way up. It shouldn't even be on here. But now it's just a scam. I don't know what anyone said. Please invest in invisibility with the hope that it will become visible. Okay. But some guys made some really big killings, right? Until they found out that it never would become visible, then they lost the But hey, so the idea is that people, okay, people on this on this line decide pension funds and people going back to even high net worth individuals, right? I made a bunch of money as a doctor or a dentist. I'm gonna buy some stock, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna try to diversify my portfolio. All I want is that the real estate. Like so, real estate obviously is more risky than stocks. Why? Do they know? Take a wild, wild guess. 100% correct. If I want to sell my Apple stock, I go right on my Fidelity thing, boom, my Apple stock sold, they want to lock, I move on. Can I sell a house in a minute and a half? What do I have to do? I have to list it with a broker, it has to be registered. There's offers that are made. There's inspections of the property. That person has to get financing. They take time and time and time. The less liquid investment is, the riskier it is subject to volatility. Right? So the less risky investment. So common stock is less risky than 
than real estate. So, a lot of investment stuff in here. We'll get to the real estate here. So, the concept is between 1994 and 2012, right after the right after the, the Great Recession, we track the 30 year treasury. So, we always want to know what the government's doing. It's important to know what the government's doing and what the government's offering, right? So, the government, if you look at March of of uh, 17, that 4.5 is 3.12, 3.16%. It moves. You can see how it moves. It moves over time. Okay. So we always want to know the government doing because what I have to do as an as a user of capital on the real estate industry, I'm investing in my business. I have to beat the treasury, right? Because if I don't beat the treasury, why would anyone invest in it? So people look at we did 150 joint ventures. Our our average joint venture IRR return was 17.2 percent. I really beat it. Okay, out of five different funds. Okay, some of it was luck, some of it was timing. There's all kinds of things that go into it. Some of it was skill, but you know that's all. All things come to, together. Now, so the concept is is what's the now that's the S and P return, the red line. What's different about them? Volatility, right? So stocks are rolling down, they're very highly volatile. Okay, the treasury gets kind of moving on along. Now, if you don't know what an index is, an index is a measure of time. Stock, if stocks were $100 in 2012, that same index was $450. So that's four and a half times over that period of time. Whatever the index number was, that's what an index is. We all know this SP index and stock index, everyone measures them by indexes. Where was it one point? Where is it the, that? So if you just bought a US Treasury, okay, if you thought if you bought a 30 year treasury, the reason the index goes up is because the interest rate went down. Okay, so that's a really important understanding. The interest rate is profit. The value is what they can buy. So if I get 5% return on my money, I go to sell my point, right? Because you have to sell one. I come back and get sold in the market. Interest rates are now 3%. The value of your bond worth is your money. The irony of it is no matter how much you play this chart, but this chart shows no matter how much you play the stocks, the basic return on the 30 year treasury note during the same period of time was pretty much the same thing. Interesting, right? So the risk free rate, because interest rates drop, was the same return at the end of the day as the stock. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down. So, People play the stock market like gambling. They literally said that's what it is, professional gambling. Because you don't know enough about a company, you will never know about enough about a company to ever truly know if you should be investing that. There's waves of knowledge. What we call it, okay? So the concept here of that is you buy low, sell high, right? Kind of old school. I play the market. It's like you know the craft table, right? You finally got the pass line, you're at the six and the eight, and they're rolling, they're rolling, you're doing great. It's gonna end. It will go down. They'll take your money at some point, but hopefully you made enough before it does that. So companies, recessions, rural events like 9-11 and COVID, they affect volatility. It has nothing to do with that company's value. It has to do with perception. Okay? Right. Okay. Maybe, just like S&P, track stocks, may create is the industry that is the index for real estate. It tracks real estate companies that have investments. Okay, we'll get to property financing in a minute. I'm not gonna read all this. You can read on it. It really serves just as the s and for real estate. Okay, so what we try to do is we try to compare ourselves to these two indexes, other indexes like the S&P. It's really, really important that we Track ourselves now. Should my return be one of those slopes? Right? So if I look at this chart, the SP between 1978 and 2014 basically ran parallel. Let's see if it didn't really outperform it. Okay. It didn't outperform it during that period of time. But here's here's the difference. The big jump between 95 before the before the Great Recession. It jumped a lot. Does anybody have any idea why? Has any of your professors ever told why it jumped so high, greater than almost everything in the planet? Because you're wrong. 
technology allowed all of you to delegate. All of the fidelity accounts, you all now are investors. You met you, you don't remember, maybe the sole people remember. You used to have to call a stockbroker, buy IBM stock before you do. He had to answer physically a phone. That took time. So that big line right there wasn't because of markets. That's why I flowed better. Now, what is CPI? Inflation. Now, of course, up to 2014, it was pretty flat. And then, of course, COVID happened. Jump, right? So they, it, it jumped terribly. The goal is you, as an investor, a real estate lending, you must be inflation. Why? You have an apple and it costs a dollar, right? And you invest in a dollar and you made it five cents. The apple is a dollar ten and you lost money. So you have to be inflation. It's almost impossible. It was impossible to beat inflation during COVID. We were having 9, 10, 12% inflation rates because of lack of materials, right? So the concept was we were getting killed by inflation. Everybody was having negative returns during the time. So normal with inflation is that people get killed on their portfolio. Cool. All right. I'm not going to that's all my fault for that. Okay. So we look at real estate again in periods of time. Okay. Over periods of time. Uh, between 2000 and 2014, which is uh, 2000, there was a recession. Do you know what happened in 2001? The dot com crash. That's where people overvalued the value of stocks of tech companies and they weren't ready. Sounds like first time? Yeah. Okay. So the concept is that between that time, when good times are rolling, when people are employed, when they, when they buy houses, when they rent apartments, when they go to retail centers, when they go to movies, they go to bars, they spend movies, all that's real estate. Those people pay rent. Those investors are making money. Real estate beats everybody. Very good times. Okay. 2015 was pretty much a peak year, pretty close to a peak year before the before COVID. Real estate was beating everybody. And gold and silver was getting killed. Why? Why does gold and silver get killed? People buy precious metals. Right. Because I want to hold a piece of gold and use gold around. Why? I have no idea. Because what are you going to do to gold and sell that? All it's, it's just a commodity to buy and sell. But in times of instability, when people make run on banks, I'm going to hold gold. So the concept is, if you see gold changing prices, that means that there's a recession coming. If you see gold tanking, that means things are going well because they're taking their money out and putting it in things. Remember, the goal in, a, a, in the capital markets of anything, but including real estate, is to beat inflation and to take advantage of returns. Okay? All right. So my favorite chart ever. Anyone know what locking down is? Where's locking down? Oh. Anyone know? Yes. Where? Is that this off the 210? Off the 210 over North Pasadena? Not here, we're in Urban, right? You usually live there, right? I see people live down, I do live there. Parents bought a house, 1958, four bedroom, four bath, on an acre of land in locking down, where nobody knew anything was happening. How much do you think about that one? Yeah, 75 and 10. 1968, I was. Check out. Somebody explain the prices, right? Is that what we're doing? $64,500. $17,500. $17,500. That house today. I went back and I looked because they sold it in 1982 when I came here. Okay, to LMU. That's that. I came over in Florida's long story. They sold it for $310,000 and I thought I killed it. 17 to 300000 for a damn good return, right? So I looked it up on Zillow. It's sold in 2018 for $4.4 .4 million. <laughs> now, I'm sure it's been remodeled since then. Okay. 
That's the trouble. Real estate. Why does it need it the long term? So it's like it's like I'm investing my money and I'm putting it aside. I'm just gonna wait. Yeah. That's it. When the more clean is, James Ryder Huff Valley, Huff Valley Finn. He was around in the 1800s, right? 1800s, I believe. He said the 1800s, buy land. They don't make any more of it. So the value of real estate long-term will beat almost any investment because you can't duplicate it. I can make more phones. I can make more cups. I can make more whatever. I can flood the market with supply. You can't flood the market with real estate supply. Okay? So real estate is the best long-term investment over the long-term. My house that I bought here 21 years ago. Little mile to the east, the like I came to school here. I go, Hey, where are you going to school? I'm going to Loyola. They go, Where? This still happen to you guys? I go, Loyola, I go, Loyola. They go, Oh, you mean Loyola, Maryland? No. Oh, you mean Loyola, Chicago? No. Well, Loyola, Maryland, Maryland, Maryland College? But that's a girl school. No, Loyola, Maryland. Where is that? I go into Westchester. They go, New York? I had this problem, right? So you can imagine that, that, and then you go, oh, it's just north of the airport. It's not a crappy area. Huh? That was the conversation. They didn't buy a house when I was at school. It's worth 10 times. That's the concept. All right, moving on. What's a, what affects those returns in real estate? Where are their up and downs? Okay, there's two up and downs. Okay, supply, you oversupply a market, just like any other product. They go, how do you oversupply anything about Phoenix? It's very hard. But in Phoenix or Dallas, Idaho, Atlanta, Florida, the entire county of Los Angeles, which has 12 million people, only has about 12,000 apartment units under At one time in Dallas, the entire Dallas center, which had a massive amount of people, had 41,000 apartments. All right, so on the way in there. Okay, so the problem is that it will all be fine, but it's the tiny one. Okay, you see much supply, I go lower my rents, I go lower my rents, my inner line goes down, there's going to go down because I go lower my rents, and it's supply. But once it's there, over the long term, it will be fine. Okay. Right? So the second thing is employment. Employment is the biggest driver of real estate. If someone said, How do I invest in real estate? What's the employment doing in that marketplace? Why? Because everything real estate related, people have to have jobs. 98% of all real estate is you need a job to either live there, you have to afford it, you go to uh, you visit it. An entertainment center or a shopping center, you know, that kind of thing. You don't have a job, you're not going out to the bar and buying a $30 drink. Hurts that business, that business goes out of business, that business vacates, that hurts the income of the real estate, the real estate value goes down. Okay, so the number one driver, people are working, value real estate good. Okay, all right. Now, there was, there's two before COVID, two major recessions. Employment and value drop down. Okay. Now, remember that chart that was 1800% over 30 years? That's the volatility. The first one in 1991-92 down this chart was because of supply. The second one was the great uh, uh, global crisis of which uh, we lost three about three million jobs. So the two biggest things: supply. Now, in markets like LA, it's almost impossible to oversupply anything. Just because it's so hard, limited land, just like New York or any of the big cities, San Francisco. So in our business here in LA, we worry more about employment in this business. If I'm in Atlanta, I'm worrying about both. Okay. Or Dallas, I'm worrying about both. Okay. So the black line is the index value. Those values drop. Okay. This will all come together in a moment. Now, cycles. Yeah. So for City 
Developers, we are in control of things. Building on building better than the owners. Three years, more amenities. We believe that all the projects will only be better than the next project. It's almost a simple thing. They were trying to catch up with people moving to Seattle. Remember when California was moving to Seattle and then just be connected to Texas or whatever, for whatever reason, developers jumped in the game to build stuff because people are moving. And everyone's relatively optimistic not to get caught in that supply zone. Yeah, we think my building will leave before the next guy. And they've been, so the first three guys, they've been great. Next three guys have break even, the first three guys lose money. That's what happens. It almost happens in North North, it's all about. Okay? All right. So, this is a supply site. Supply and this is the, this is a, a chart that was done by a, a professor uh, back in East, which was done in 1996. I know it's old. This is what kind of works. There's basically four cycles in real estate. Okay. The when there's always a recovery phase. When you saw those two dips and those those two dips of those recessions, right? That's the bottom. That's number one. Value dropped because too much supply. I had the lower rents. Because of the lower rents, my values went down. Uh, my debt was coming due, and I had to sell and I sold for loss. I bought a house here in Westchester. You know, at a uh, million five, and I put a million in, so I'm in for two five, and I can sell it to four. And all of a sudden, interest rates rise, and everyone who's buying four million dollar houses go, wait, my interest rate is eight percent, I can't afford it. The price of the house goes down because nobody can afford the house, right? Because interest rates broke. Okay. So the concept is, is that what happens is, is that there's a long term average occupancy average of the apartment. I'm going to just get the apartment for a moment. And so what happens is, is that uh, employment's down, vacancies are up, occupancy is down, there's negative rent growth, I have lower rents. Do you think that'd be a good time to buy? Do I buy at one or 10? I buy at one, right? Because the cycle has never not happened, by the way. It doesn't stay there forever. Even Michigan, by the way. Now, it stayed below for a very long time until Rocket Mortgage came in. They kind of saved, they saved uh, Detroit. That's a whole study in itself. So the idea is I want to buy between one and six. But it ends up happening, those growth factors start hungering again after the Great Recession. Start moving. They start, oh, I'm in this crappy apartment, one bedroom studio that's you know, built 1962. I'm going to move into a new apartment. The rents get, uh, places get filled. People have get jobs. They move to that particular market. Rent grows. All of a sudden, the developers move. So the concept is, is that they start building between seven and eleven up there. And they build and they build and they build, and people finance them, and the capital markets gives them money. They the debt and the equity markets give them money because they all everyone's believing that there's all this growth with all this uh, employment. Then what ends up happening in Phoenix and some markets, you get this ten percent buy this too much supply. Which is too much supply. So that happens. It's the critical lowering in reds. There's red growth, it's decelerating, you kind of thing. And then when it jumps back into a recession, I have too much supply. We lose jobs, great recession, and you go down into the bottom. It's happened consistently for the last 60 years. Never not happened. Just so you know. Okay. So the idea of, of real estate investment as a capital kind of concept is that timing is the most important concept here. What do you think we are right now? Great question. Okay, three things affect three things affect value of real estate. Three things. Okay. I need to do why? What's third one? What's what's the the value of real estate? Hmm? Hmm? That that factors, but that's definitely number seven. <laughs> that's to the value. But what what are the, what's the third biggest one? Say. 
because you couldn't borrow money from a bank every time Saturday and work that you do for $200,000. Okay. You don't have any. If you get a 50, you borrow 750, you get a little check. Other than that. So where are interest rates today? What are they considered today? Higher or lower? Higher. Why are they weak? Inflation. How do we where did inflation come from? COVID. How did COVID make inflation go higher? Correct. We put too much money in the economy, which means you didn't have a job, you should have gone to bar after three dollars, but the government gave you three dollars and spent it anyway. That's a bad thing to do. Okay. okay. So I'm sorry, don't buy the drink or what thing? <laughs> no, the government don't give the person to buy the drink. Don't give the person the thirty dollars because they're unemployed. The, the problem with that is that they just didn't get money to live. People were making they were getting great money and still going and spending money. In recession, people spend less money. If people spend less money, what if you don't buy chicken at the store because you don't have any money? What's the price of chicken do? Goes down. Uh, that's, that's kind of what that argument I think about brand is that money is there, okay? That we don't have to buy that particular type of paper. We can control the inflation. We're just not buying it. Okay. Let's tell 300 million well, people. I know. Not to think you want to be smart. Not to think you'll buy stuff. But don't complain. I need to upgrade. I need to upgrade my iPhone. Sure. Go on. No, well, the government needed not to give the money. We cannot get out of all the money. We are an, our entire economy. That's like, all we do. I feel like the money wasn't there, that we definitely had some kind of true effect. Yes. Yes. So it's almost like a buffer. I didn't know the truth that was almost safe. Um, and I agree with the money going in the hands of people versus the corporations of the bar. And then, you know, we saw when the Bernal and the Bernal and the Bernal and the Bernal life, but this way, no regulars. True. It was, it was, it was less of a bandy being returned. The problem was it delayed it because yeah. everything has to be packed. If you get too drunk in Vegas and you pass out, you cannot keep drinking. At one point, you will die of alcohol poisoning or pass out. You'll get thrown at your bed, you wake up the next morning, you don't realize how much money you lost. Okay? You have no concept. That's what the problem is. We as consumers, so we, we just can't help ourselves. I don't feel like we control so much of it. It's like it's almost like that. It's like we get that now. We're like, that's not even now. Not even 50 and I don't know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, we need to get into a whole debate about that. We're gonna we're gonna stay in we're gonna stay involved in, in this. But the the concept the concept is interest rates rise because of inflation. When interest rates rise, the value of real estate goes down. It's that simple. Okay, let's let's do let's do a simple math to show you how that works. Okay, supply, employment, interest rates. I buy a million dollar house. Do a simple math here, okay? I borrowed seven hundred fifty thousand dollars at six percent, and I put two hundred fifty thousand dollars down. What's my what's my mortgage? How much is my mortgage? <clears throat> what's my mortgage? Simple math. Someone do it on a calculator. Seven fifty times six percent. Two hundred thousand divided by twelve. Probably three grand, four grand. 3750. 3750. I have a nice job. I can afford that. Okay. Now we have inflation. So I can buy a million dollar house because I can afford this payment. Right? Okay. Now interest rates rise. Take 3700 times 12. What was that? 40? 45. 45. Thousand, yeah. The say interest rates are now eight percent. What's the value of the home? Higher or lower? It's the exact same payment. The value of the house is higher or lower? Well, let's do the math. If I take forty-five thousand and I divide by 0.08, 
What do I get? Six. Twenty-five thousand divided by point oh eight. What is it? Five six two five hundred. Five hundred sixty-two thousand. Yeah. Ah. Five hundred sixty-two thousand. But I only have two hundred fifty thousand dollars to put down. I don't have any more money. Oh, what's the value of the house? Roughly eight hundred twelve thousand dollars. Interest rates went up two points. The value of the house went down because that's the payment I can afford. Everybody got that? That's the concept of how interest rates affect. Okay, so now we got supply, how it affects, employment, how it affects, and interest rates, how it affects. All right, this was in 2021. They haven't done an update since, um, but this is where they believe the markets were at that time in 2021. This is where the apartment market was, yeah. Yes, I wanted to ask since it's from 1996, how would you update it now? Ah, good question. Well, oh, no, this is no, this is in 2021. They used the model and they stuck the markets where they thought the markets were. So we do this, right? So where should I be buying if I'm doing real estate? Long Island, Miami, Orlando. Yeah, Orlando. I should be looking for deals there because the values are dropping. Where should I not be buying? Anything in phase three? Hyper supply. All of these markets are getting close to hyper supply. You asked where we were, okay? You asked where we were right now. That's where we are right now. That has not changed since 2021. 2024, what's happened is, is that the high interest rates have stalled it. So people can't trade because the interest rates are too high. So it's right now, it's about where we are. We're in hyper supply. The only difference with, the only difference with some markets like LA, New York, and some of the markets where you can't oversupply those markets still lease, but the value of the real estate is less because the interest rates are higher. So I still lease my apartment building for $2,000 a month for a one bedroom here in LA. It's $800 in Phoenix, right? Problem is I can't sell it because nobody <laughs> wants to, nobody wants to sell it with interest rate. Okay. All right. Why do we do this? Oh my gosh. That's so much to get to over your talk. All right. Why do we do this? Well, The concept is every, like I said, every piece of property needs finance, needs capital. Nobody has it. Even the billionaires leverage. Why do we leverage? Because we diversify our money. If I had $100 million, I'm not going to do $100 million building. I'd like to do 10, put $10 million in 10 buildings to diversify my risk, right? So I always leverage. I always use other people's money. I always have, I always need capital in which to do that, okay? So- the capital market, someone who's in capital markets has to understand where we are in the cycle. Should I invest in that market? Okay. What to finance the use? Should I, should I be investing in office buildings right now? Why not? It's going to work remotely. So things happen, right? Should I be in, you know, those are the kinds of concepts, right? Should I be investing in $20 million homes? In Compton. <laughs> no, simple, right? Because you know that's not value. That's nothing wrong with that. It's just it's just the concept. Okay. So where to finance, who to finance, when to finance, and where. We need we always pick in the finance business. This, remember, it's the capital market side. Okay. So we, when I was in the investment business, we this is what we did. We did strategies of where we should be. We looked at thousands and gallons of data, which is about as accurate as the weather. They get it about half right. OK, so you take that, you take the kind of the malarkey that everyone does, because everyone always picked it wrong, and you make interpretations of what to do with capital. I get all that pension fund. Where am I going? Am I going to Phoenix to do this? Am I going to LA to do that? Am I going to New York to do this? Where am I doing that? OK, so I typically, as a finance guy, I would look for experts in those markets. But if you had a California developer and he calls me up and says, hey, I need $50 million to do an office building in New York, I'd be like, why is a California developer developing in New York? Why is that important? Why is that important? Because they don't own the market. Now, if they have an office there and they have a local guy there, that's different. Okay. So we talk about where we want to finance at all times. Okay. This is my other favorite thing. This is from Warren Buffett, by the way. Who knows who Warren Buffett is? Yeah. I know people in my class have already seen this, so I, sorry. 
you, but you get the credit. So there's nothing wrong with that. So the idea is Warren Buffett is the smart money. Okay. This again has never not happened in the stock market ever. Never not happened. Okay. So you always you're always picking in the stock market. Where am I going to be? This, what the smart money does is we call it the stealth phase. Okay. What market is really going to explode, which unlikely nobody knew about, but I did my research and I found out that Toyota is moving their plant from Torrance, California to Plano, Texas. Anyone know where Plano, Texas is? It is the boonies. Why did they do that? Tax. Tax incentives. No state tax. Woo. Right? So they moved their whole company. I think if you knew that, subsidies and, and subsidies, right? Just like when Amazon was looking for its new headquarters and every city was offering, right? If you knew the inside track, not insider trading, but if you knew the inside track where Amazon was going to pick it, wouldn't you want to buy every piece of real estate around where Amazon's going to build their new thing? That's the sell phase, is finding out the trends and what things happen. How many people know where Echo Park is? Where's Echo Park? Is it a nice area? <laughs> Was it a crappy area before? Yeah. And it became a trendy area? Yeah. Does anyone know why the crappy area became the trendy area? Affordability is a big one. What else? Y'all, well, you're all too young, but I just sent a text when I said that. Y'all. What's that? Yeah, it's just, okay. It's divide now, but it was pretty scary. So the millennials, okay, they wanted to shift from being in Irvine Company apartments, which are the ones that are down in Playa Vista, which are nice and pretty and have soul there for your $22, you know, margarita. And they wanted urban chic. They wanted urban chic. They wanted it rough. They wanted to walk around with a the dark bar and go, hey, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's what happened. So a social trend made an area hit. Happens all the time. Okay. Cities may do that. City of North Hollywood. North Hollywood was a piece of junk. Still is a piece of junk. But it was really a piece of junk. Yeah. We do a lot of reading. So think about it. The day. So. You guys remember, well, when I was in school here, where Playa Vista was, or where Downsend, where YouTube is, and all those times, that was a runway. If you ever saw The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio, that's where the Spruce Goose was. And even when I was in college, I had a buddy who, uh, I had a buddy who uh, worked at Westchester Golf Course. He'd bring a bucket of golf balls, and we'd drink beer and hit balls into the, into the runway, because it was closed by the, in 1982. Okay. So that was a runway with a big giant building that used to have the Spruce Goose in it. Who's in the Spruce Goose building now? Google. Right? So that didn't happen overnight. That definitely didn't happen overnight. That was a 20-year entitlement, re-entitlement of that lane. And the big reason was is there's a big methane uh, tip, lane's quite contaminated because they flew airplanes for 20 years there. So if you go down there, you'll see a little methane. If you go down there, you see the methane uh, alarms. Right, the methane breaks. Okay. So the concept is how do you pick it? Lots of research. You'll read. People are moving to Plano. I knew someone was moving to Plano. One of our best friends' daughter worked for Toyota. She lived here in Westchester in a tiny two bedroom, one bath, little tiny house on the other side of La Tierra. She came home and said, Hey, mom, guess what I'm doing? I'm moving to Plano. Why? Toyota's moving all their thing. She sold that tiny little two bedroom house and bought a five bedroom, three bedroom house in Plano with a pool. Okay, so you can imagine research, 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 always finding out what's happening, even trends. Trends determine the value of real estate. Westchester is the weirdest place on the planet. If you ask most Los Angeles people, they still couldn't tell you where it is. It's the weirdest thing. But what happened was it's because of the flight of it and YouTube and all and Fox and everybody who moved down there, rising tides lift all boats. And everyone, all of a sudden, he goes, wow, Westchester's just like literally up the hill from where I work. And I can't afford Santa Monica. I can't afford Brentwood. 
So all of a sudden, the rising tide of that market made this prop made my property go crazy because I bought 21 years ago before they were there. Okay, so stealth phase that's where you make the most money. Whenever you're doing real estate investment, if somebody would say, I got a deal, I have a deal in downtown in LA to build a brand new office building, you'd be like, What? I don't know if I'd build a brand new office building in downtown LA right at the moment. Okay, why? The research tells me people living at home. The other research is telling me that the vacancy of office buildings is like 26% in downtown LA. That's bad. 26% is bad. Okay. So the concept is where we go. So what happens is the smart guy figures it out, figures out that, uh, figures out some trend that has that, uh, you know, uh, Silver Lake and Echo Park is coming in, starts buying property around that. Brokers get the brokers get the idea that they start calling all their other people. Hey, the smart money's buying an Echo Park right now. Then it starts to take off. The value goes up and up and up and up and up. And it gets and the institutionals, Goldman Sachs gets involved. Aries gets involved, 50, $55 billion hedge fund. They start buying. They buy here and they sell there. Does anybody know why? Why wouldn't you just hang on longer? Why do institutional people sell in their institutional world? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry? Meet their quota. It's all about quarterly quotas for them. They want their Christmas bonus. They make a certain amount of return. They get in, they get out. It's the dumbest thing on the planet. I had that money for 20 years. I did $3 billion of investment in real estate. We built our very first apartment building in Santa Monica. I built it. I built a 54-unit apartment building for $18 million in 1999. We sold it for $41 million in 2000. Today, it's worth $61 million. But we made a great return to that investor, right? We had them a 28% return. Remember the return over here? So this is, this, is, this is corporate. And all of a sudden, you turn on the news, Channel 5 News. You turn on the news, and you go, right here and says hey i hear echo parks really cool let's let's go down to Susie down there at echo park at the corner of blank and blank and Susie's sitting there and she's going, if you can see there's bars and people walking all over the place that's the media most institutional people are out or they're still there but they're trying to get out now what ends up happening is that everyone hears about it and enthusiasm happens and the public gets involved and they start buying and all of a sudden some guy buys a duplex in an Echo Park goes, oh, I'm an Echo developer. Happens all the time. They raise a lot of money and they start doing it and they don't have any idea what they're doing. And all of a sudden, everyone gets greedy. We called it, because this is, this is too much, too old for you. Um, we used to call it cab driver syndrome. When I used to go, I used to go around the world and raise money. So I'd be, I've been to the Arab nations, I've been to Europe, I've been to China, I've been all kinds of places to raise money. And everywhere I go, I get in a cab. I used to get in a cab, now I get an Uber, but I get in a cab. And I always talk to the person, okay? And I'd be either here in the States, I'd be in San Diego, New York, I'd go, hey, so tell me what's going on, where are the hip places, what's going on, is there a good bar I go to, a good restaurant, da, 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 da. how's the real estate market? Cab driver says, I don't know, I don't know anything about the real estate market. Right here. A few years go by. Cabin writer said, Oh, you know, I'm flipping houses now. <laughs> That's great. That's when everybody knows about it. That's when everybody does it. That's when you know it's all going fresh. People who don't do this professionally start thinking they're doing it professionally. That's when the markets crash. Okay. All right. Then all of a sudden, the greed becomes delusional. I could buy a house in Westchester for $4 million, put a million in, and sell it for $10 million. Well, the closest comp in Westchester is like three and a half million. You think you could sell for 10? Yeah, Google just moved down here, man. It's great. Some rich guy's going to buy my house for $10 million. I go, but you're like on the corner, like across the street from Vons. I'm confused. No, man, it's great. It's going to be good. I'm flipping houses. I'm so good at what I do. Okay. What ends up happening is they try to look at the house market for $10 million. Not selling, not selling. So they drop the price, and they drop the price, and they drop the price. And now, so the price drops to a point where he says, Okay, I'm going to finally sell. Everything's fine. It's going to sell for four million. I can sell, I get knock a 10. I'm okay. Whatever, you know, kind of thing. And then everyone goes, Okay, everything's fine. Let's go back up to 10. 
that's where that little thing goes back up. Then what happens is, okay, I'm trying to get 10, eight, nine, eight, 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 seven, I'm gonna lose money, oh shit, trouble, I got uh, capitulation, that's the five stages of death, right? Anger, denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. That's all capitulation. Can't believe it. It's only worth three million. I thought it was worth 10 and it dies and you die in despair and lose money. Okay. Now, the biggest gain and the biggest fall is because of the public perception of the investments. And it's even more so now today because you can all buy stock easily. That's why stock prices jump so much all the time. Because greed, that's the greed, which turned definitely into delusional, was crypto. And a guy bought a little crypto thing for 0.0000014. He sold it for 0.0018. He made a bundle of money. Woo! Then somehow it got to a dollar and it disappeared. That's where capitulation came in. People got hammered. Because the value of that was just not the value that it sustainable over time. And then what ends up happening drops and we start all over again. Do you think, you think we're in return to normal right now? Or do you think we're in Ah, where does everybody think we are right now in this? Ricky, I feel like we're super scared of a recession. Interest rates were high. Now they're talking about they might, they're going to drop them again. At least they say they'll probably start rolling them again. Right. It feels like maybe we won't get a recession when things are unstable. So maybe we start putting money back in, yeah, thinking yeah, everything's right. okay. It's kind of correct, right? Right. So there are many businesses because of COVID that did very, very, well. very, very, very well. I have a buddy who lives in Westchester who got into the mask business way before masks were a thing. <laughs> and made a, more money than he made in his prior 25 years of working at a bank. Okay, so that was, he figured it out. Okay. Then all of a sudden you can get him now at, at uh, CBS and his business, right? Kind of concept. So where are we in the economy? We, for the past three years, have been at fear. We've been at fear. Now, why the reason what what is up happening, but we have not we're not a capitulation yet. In other words, we still think we're not remember the five stages of death, right? Anger, denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, right? Ends up all the time. We are in bargaining right now. That's where we are in the marketplace. We're in the bargaining of fear and capitulation. I swear it's not gonna go down anymore. I think it's okay. And then the tech company lays off a bunch of people, but then they hire a bunch of people. Then it's, everything's confusing right now. We have high interest rates because of lack of supply. However, however, we just hired 200,000 people last month, the nation. It makes no sense. So there's this fear and capitulation of what's going to happen. We're sitting on a slippery slope right now. Okay. And now it's an election year. So it's just going to hang there until after the election year. It's going to hang there till the election year. Okay. All right. Let's move on to real estate. What else? A lot of investment. How do we apply this to real estate? Well, we value real estate, income producing real estate. Not, not churches, not schools, not single family homes. People that have rent, that's a retail center, storage facility, hotel, an apartment building, all of those things. That's what we invest. That's where all the money that we just talked about between stealth phase and growth and annualized returns and all that comes together. That's what they do. This is how we value real estate. Now, net operating income, very simple. It's EBITDA. You're in the finance business, it's just earnings before depreciation for taxes and amortization, which is all the revenues in, all the costs to run the building, less all the costs to run the building. Okay? So let's take an apartment building, very simple. What's the biggest revenue in an apartment building? What are you paying? Rent. Rent. Is there any other things you pay? What else? Utilities. What else you pay? Storage. What else you pay? Parking. Right? Maybe you paid an application fee when you when you tried to get in the building. That's all the income of an apartment building. A retail center is very simple. There's tenants. Tenants pay rent. Office building, simple. Tenants, they pay rent. They pay parking, right? You pay, you go down to Seoul and you park there, 
You don't get stamps, you pay parking. That's income. That's a piece of real estate, right? Down there when you park, you rent, okay? So you take all the revenue, okay? That is collected in a year. We always do this annually because we look at annualized returns. And I take out all the expenses of an apartment building. What are expenses of an apartment building? What do I have to pay as an owner? Maintenance. Maintenance, some breaks. What else? Yeah. Management, people have to run the building. Yeah. Property taxes, because it's a property, right? Some, if it burns, I need, burns down, I need sure. insurance. So I pay premiums, I pay people, I pay property tax, I pay maintenance, I pay utilities, I build back some of that to the tenant. Those are the expenses. Revenue minus expense, just like a company. A piece of property is just a company, it's out. Five billion in, three billion out, I make two billion dollars, that's seven or net operating income. We value real estate, real estate on the unleveraged, before I leverage, okay, if we're talking about capital markets, I value the building. So. I take the value, it's the net operating income, divided by, we call, the capitalization rate. This is why I did all this stuff earlier. The capitalization rate is a little confusing. Why do we call it a capitalization rate? It's stupid. We should just say, hey, that's the annualized rate of return I want for that income. That's all it is. We capitalize the value of the building based upon the return I want. So let's do easy math. Then the building. NOI in a building, that's revenue my expenses, and over a cap rate, which is my rate of return, and there is a million dollars of NOI, and I wanted a 5% return on that. That means if I paid cash, right? I wrote a check, what's the value of the building? If I take a million dollars divided by 0 0.05, what is that worth? 20 million, right? That means the value of that building is $20 million. Because if I wrote a check for $20 million, I would make $1 million of income a year. I have no debt, right? I don't pay anything. So I wrote checks just like if you bought a bond and got 4%, right? Same concept, right? We just reversed it for it. So all I did is it said, it's a million dollars and I want a 5% return. Oh, that means the value of that building is worth $20 million. Before leverage, before I do anything else. Everybody understand the concept? It's really important to understand the concept. Now, how would the cap rate pay? Because it was me, I won 20% return, 50% return. How's it pay? How do you think it's paid? Well, I mean, you have to make more than. Bonds, gotta be inflation and bonds, inflation bonds. because otherwise I might as well just do because remember this million dollars is a guarantee it's a guarantee it will always be a million dollars if I had an oh. office building you think I guarantee that million dollars is guaranteed yeah. so I'm going to want a higher return because it ain't guaranteed there's volatility to it right right that means I would want a higher return because I want to leverage I want to I want to the higher risk, the higher return, right? Just like that little chart. Same thing with real estate. Office building, probably higher cap rate or, or return I want versus an apartment building, okay? Now, if my apartment building is in Bakersfield versus Santa Monica, would Bakersfield have a higher return or lower return than Santa Monica? Just like the world works, huh? Thanks. So if I was going to, I have money, I just won the lottery, $20 million, right? And I can buy building Santa Monica versus a building big. So which market do you think is more stable? Santa Monica. So if Santa Monica is more stable, is the cap rate lower in Santa Monica or higher? Lower. Lower, because I'll take a lower return because I believe Santa Monica is more stable. Okay? So this is determined by the volatility of the NOI. And... Where the market is, where the market, who you compete. I'm not the only developer in the world, buyer of real estate. I just made an offer on a piece of dirt. There were 31 offers on the piece of dirt. 31, I was one of 31 people. When I'm one of 31 people, I know I'll never win it because I won't. I just won't do it, okay? So part of it's determined in the market, part of it's determined in the volatility of a million dollars. Everybody with me? Okay. 
because it's going to get a little more complicated in one minute. So I did that. Okay. What's a buyer willing to pay? $20 million because that's without leverage. I wrote a check for $20 million. I get 5% return on money. And volatility. Things have got to get fixed. So maybe that volatility is a little more over time. Okay. All right. Volatility. Pretty simple. Okay. The volatility. Are the rents stable? Is the occupancy stable? So we do all our stealth research. We all the research on the long-term history occupancy average of Phoenix. Okay, everyone wants to sell you a building in Phoenix when the occupancy are at 95%. But I have a long-term average is like 83%. Which means if I bought a building based on that occupancy, I'd be losing money over time. Okay. So current market conditions, interest rates, very important. That's how we value it. Okay. Now, this is a very complicated chart, and I'm going to go through it quickly because it would drive you crazy. The bar is on the bottom. That's the U.S. Treasury rate. Okay, that's what it is. That's the U.S. Treasury rate. So I must beat the U.S. Treasury rate returns, right? I need to be higher than them, or I just should buy a rate. So we'll just take the we'll take some of the lines. Those are all average cap rates of purchases of properties in the U.S. In other words, the return people want. They're all higher than Treasury rate, isn't it? That's good. And they should be. Smart people who invest are above the Treasury rate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. What they said on average over time, it goes up and down because the rates go up and down. So if the treasuries go up, what happens to the cap rate? What happens to the return? It goes up. It has to have a spread between the treasury rate and what I'm willing to pay for a piece of property. Okay? So what they say, these are JP Morgan, RCA, and the, and the NACRE says typically cap rates or rates of unleveraged return on my NOI are typically somewhere between two and 300 basis points above the treasury rate. So, surgery is at four, what should I be buying at? Seven. I want a 7% return. I want to beat it because that's the average. I want to beat the treasury. Now, if I buy at seven, inflation is nine. Am I losing money? I'm losing money. So, you know what ends up happening? Nothing trades. Because some guy's not going to discount it because he bought it maybe at a seven. Now, it's really worth nine because I'm losing money because of inflation. Okay. So the idea for us, how we how we invest, is we want to beat the treasury rate by about 300 basis points. Okay? Now, how do I, as a developer, figure that out? Well, very simple. Okay? I'm going to take an apartment building. Very simple apartments. Okay? I'm the developer. I have three costs associated with building an apartment building that will generate NOI, right? What are those things? What do you think those three things are? I have three major components. Rent. No, what What are my costs? What do I have to do if I'm going to be spending? Land. Land. That's a big one. Okay. That's one. Construction. Construction costs. The carpet. The ceiling. Cost me to build this, right? I got to build the apartment building. So we call that hard costs. One more, a little trick here. Soft costs. What are soft costs in a real estate deal? Nope, he's in the hard costs. Brokers fees, finance fees. I hire an architect to draw the building because I don't draw the building, right? I'm a developer. I put all these people together. I hire an entitlement consultant to get it entitled. I go through, I get it. An expediter to put it to the city so I can buy permits. I'm charged permit fees. I have to get an environmental report on the property to make sure it's not a toxic waste dump. I get reports. All of those things go into soft cost. It's just like I'm building, like I'm making a movie, right? I got my actors, I got my I got my cinematographer, I got my vacation scouts. All of it has to go together to make the movie, putting it all together to make the building. Okay. So let's say I bought a piece of property for a million dollars. It cost me $5 million. I'm going to go through an example of hard costs. I went to call the contractor. It's $5 million bucks to build the building. Okay. And there was half a million dollars in soft costs, architects, fees, so forth. I was able to buy the land for a million dollars. So I'm in for $6.5 million. Okay. That's how much it's going to cost me to build that building. Let's say it's 10 units. I go to the marketplace and I say, where are the rents? What are my expenses? And I make a projection of NOI, of net operating income. I make a projection. It's not there. 
it's not guaranteed I'm right, but you do a lot of stealth research to find out what rents are, what expenses are, what it's going to cost to run this building, right? That kind of thing. And I get to my NOI. Okay. So let's say that I get to my NOI for this building. I did all that underwriting, went to the marketplace, made ex I made, I made the operating expense assumptions that because I've been in the business and it generates $500,000 of NOI. I win the lottery, I can write a check. I can write a check okay. for that. What's my return on my money? I'm putting out six and a half, I'm getting 500 back. What's my return? How do I do that? Remember, remember value, take my NOI, divided by my total cost. What does that equal? What's 500,000 divided by six and a half million? I'm going to do it real quickly. What is it? 7.6%. That would be my return on my development, right? So if I wrote the check for six and six and a half million, generates 500,000 of income, net income, I'm making 7% of my money, right? Simple. That is what we call the developer return on cost. That's my return on my cost, right? 500,000 return on my cost, six and a half million. This is how we value real estate. Now, if I went to the market, I built the building, I hit this exactly, 500,000. It cost me six and a half million, exactly. By the way, none of that ever happens. But let's just say it does, okay? Let's just say it does. And I hit this exactly. I go out to the marketplace. I want to sell the building. The brokers come back and say, well, best offer we have is an eight cap rate an 8% return. Can I sell it for a profit? Well, let's do the math. Remember, I have 500,000, just like we did the interest rate, divided by 0 0.08. What is that person willing to pay for it? What's 500,000 divided by 0 0.08? Let me do it. So 500,000 divided by 0 0.08 is? What's that? Ah, 6.25 million. Did I make any money? No, I suck. Built for six and a half and I can only sell for six two. Because someone perceived that the risk of the income was greater than my return on my money. Right? So the way that we look at things is we look at what's the return on my money versus what someone is willing to pay for it when it's completed. Is it more risky when I'm building it? It's more risky when I'm building it. So I should have a pretty high return because it's risky. And if I'm selling it, I need a spread or a difference between the return on cost and the cap rate or the return someone's willing to do when it's, when it's done. Now, let's say that someone says, you know what? I think it's done, it's in Santa Monica. I'm gonna take a 6%. So I take 500,000 divided by 6%. What's he willing to pay now? What's 500,000 divided by 0 0.06? 8.3, right? So he's willing to pay 8 million three. Did I make a profit? That's because my return, when I built it, is greater than what someone's perception of return once it's built. Kind of makes sense, right? My return should be greater because I'm building it. <laughs> it takes, it's hard and the city's a pain in the ass and it rains like it did. I lost 11 days due to this rain. So you think my six and a half is holding true right now? Sure ain't. I lost four months last winter. I'm, I'm five months behind now. You lost four months last winter because of the rain? Yeah, because we were digging the hole. And we had a giant hole there. And we were spending hours with pumps 24 7. Even when that's, you can't do that in the city of Los Angeles, pumping water out. And then the water, the, the dirt had to dry, right? COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So I had concrete guys pouring concrete, right? They say, hey, I'm coming Thursday to pour concrete. Rains. Do you think they come the next day? They have 25 other jobs that are now behind. I can get to you in uh, next month. And we sat there for a month because they couldn't work. Just because it rained. 
There's volatile. I take risk in this. That's my risk. And I take risk what someone's willing to pay for. Can so I need a spread. Right? So in this example, let's take this out. If you remember, my return on cost or the developer's return on cost was 7.6%. Someone was willing to buy her, was willing to say, I'll take a 6% return on my money. I have what's called a 1.6% developer spread. I have a, you know, simple. Phone costs 1000 sell it for 1200 20% profit, right? Same thing. So we look at we look at the concept of I need a spread here between what someone's going to buy it when it's done and what I'm building it. Simple. Single family homes are easier to think of. I built the house for a million, I sold it for a million, two of twenty percent. But in the in the investment capital markets world, if you're ever in real estate, you will say cap rate more than any other word that you'll ever use. I've said the word cap rate more than any other word, um, except when I'm talking to the city. I use a lot of choice words with them. But um, other than that. The concept is you will use cap rate. What are people willing to pay for that property at that location, at that whole time, based on interest rates, and I have to be a higher return than that. So I'm going. Everyone with me so far? Questions? Okay, we're cooking now. So let's do an example. This was a real example, by the way. It's a real life example. We built 100 units in, uh, in Colorado. It cost me $40 million land. Hard cost, soft cost. We projected the stabilized NOI was going to be two point six million dollars. I went in the marketplace. I did rents. I did other income. I did. I did all my stealth work. I did all my operating expenses. And at the end of the day, I think it's going to be two six. By the way, I've never hit that number exactly. Sometimes you do better. Sometimes you do worse. Sometimes you get nailed out because people's perceptions are different. But you have to make a projection. Contractor says I can build the building for twenty million dollars. And by the time we're done, it's $22 million, and now it's $42 million to build the building. Those are the risks we take. The developer takes those risks. Okay? All right. So I bought land for $6 million. It cost me twenty nine to build, $5 million in soft costs. That's financing costs, architects, engineers, permits and fees, um, uh, donating to people's campaigns so they'll approve your building, those kind of things. So the concept was, if I take my $2 million six over my $40 million, that's a 6.5% return on my money. Again, people, I don't understand that. If I wrote a check for $40 million, I'm making two six of income. That's just a bond, right? I'm just, but there's volatility to that, right? I'm just making six and a half percent of my money. Okay. I went to the marketplace and the brokers and people in the marketplace and the comps in the marketplace say, gee, I think I could sell for a four and a half cap. And you go, four and a half cap? That's a treasury rate. You're not buying a treasury rate. That's just dumb. Why do they do that? Why would someone buy it at four and a half if I can just buy a treasury bond right now at four and a half? What can't you do with a, a, a treasury bond that you can do with real estate? What's well, value can change? Hmm? I hear it, sorry. No, I can leverage it. I can leverage it. Everybody le leverages real estate because people don't have $40 million of cash line. Well, some people. But most people leverage it. I'll tell you why leverage is important. We're talking about capital markets. Leverage is the key. Okay. So the idea is that I have a six and a half. I can sell it for four and a half. I have a 200 basis point spread. That means I can make mistakes and I'll still make money. That means that the property, if I take two million six divided by four and a half, I get $58 million. Built the building for $40 million. Sold the building for $58 million. For a lot of bid. Okay. I had to pay a broker 3% closing costs and that nature. Sellers cost, those kind of things. I take my $40 million, we made $60 million of profit. That's a 28% profit. Okay. So what we do for a living is we find sites to build apartments to meet a need, right? To meet that need of housing that we believe everybody needs, right? For the profit, for the purpose of investing and making a profit. That's what we do in our business. The capital markets finances this business. That's what it does. Because I don't have $40 million lying around. Even if I did, I wouldn't put it in the profit. So everybody with me so far? Sort of? Kind of? All right. Moving on. So the capital markets. Here's all our buddies. I have $40 million. I need $40 million. Okay. I want to leverage it. Now, do banks require to, for the developer to put in money? What do they call that? Anybody know what they call that for real estate? 
down payment if it's a house. In our business, it's called skin in the game. <laughs> got to have some skin in the game. You, I just can't loan you $40 million. You got some money in it because you'll just walk away if it goes bad. We call that skin in the game. We call that common equity. Okay, so I, if I have $40 million, I go to Bank of America, Sandy Tell, if you go to the bank, she'll lend you somewhere between 60, 50 to 65% of that $40 million. And he'll charge you a rate, right? Just like you get interest rate. Now, what do you think what do you think he's gonna charge? He's gonna charge somewhere between four and eight percent. Well, it's a crappy return. I'm I'm not I'm using an inflation. It's kind of hard, but that's what they typically they're 50 to 75 percent of that 40 million dollars. They'll make you sign an obligation to pay half. They come back to your house and you don't, that's called recourse financing. Okay, they mean business. Okay. They're short term. They just want you to build it and either sell it or refinance them out. They are short term lenders. Bank of America, the Wells Fargo, the Chase banks. They make real estate loans and they turn them and they turn them and they turn them. Their best model in banking is that a rolling loan, rolling loan, gathers no loss. Okay, over time. Now they charge about four to eight percent. So how in the world do they make money? Where do they get their money? Where does Bank of America get their money? From you. They get them from you. What do they pay you? 0.1, percent So they're lending, they're paying you 0.1%. They're lending it out at 4% or 5%. They're making a spread. Just like the spread of, that I'm making when I build real estate, the finance people make spreads at the cost of their money and the cost to run their business versus what they get charged. The other way they make money is they do billions and billions and billions of loans and charge fees and things of that nature. The fees run the business, the spread makes the money. That's how banks make money. They pay you one, they lend it out at five. Okay, investment banking, Goldman Sachs, they do the exact same thing, but with investments. They pay an investor 12%, they put it out at 18%. Okay, that's the, that's the business. But I, we're talking real estate. So I go borrow 65% from a bank. They give me a three-year loan, they charge me 5%. Okay, so I still need money. There's three different parts of the capital stack. Typically, after the after the after the debt, it's called equity. That's the sweat. That, that's sweating. That's the capital. That's the risk capital. Okay, because senior banking, these guys, they put a first deed of trust on the property. Anyone know what a first deed of trust is? Is it the first person that gets paid? It's the first person that gets paid when the property gets sold. They are first in line. The mezzanine, that's a second. They would be second in line. Then there's preferred equity and common equity. If you're common equity, you're the developer, you're last in line to get the money. So again, if I built that for $40 million, what's 65% of 40 million? It's worth 24 million, million bucks, right? So I built it for 40, they gave me a $25 million loan. I sell it for $30 million, it makes fine. They got paid off because they got paid first. But I lost money, right? Because I'm paid last. Okay. So people stack these kind of returns. So the debt gets paid four to eight. If I get paid second, I should get paid more because I'm being paid second, not first. So they typically want eight to 10% on their money. If you're paid third in preferred equity, gosh, I want 14 to 18% on my money leverage because I'm third paid. And if I'm common equity, a JV partner, JV equity, all the, all the high net worth individuals that I have in my deals, well, gosh, they want 16, 18 plus. Annualized, remember the annualized return over here that we did? That was the returns because it's risky. You're the last paid. You are the last person paid. Therefore, you're taking all the spread risk, all the rain, all the delays in the city, all the COVID. We had wood prices on our project in Culver City. Go from $110 a lineal foot to $480 a lineal foot because of COVID. Because all the mills were closed. The last guy makes the highest return because he takes the highest risk. Everybody understand that? So that's what we call the capital stack. Yeah. Somebody learn the skills to like model this out separately like on itself. Like where can I learn to model that? Where can you learn to model that? Uh, if you work, <laughs> if you get a job in an investment bank, that's all you'll do. You will model this. You will model returns. I have a model that I developed when we were investment banking. It's like, I don't know, it's four gigs and it has, you know, 2,700 tabs in it. It's ridiculous. You don't need that much. 
Okay. We should call it, if you can't figure it out on the back of an envelope, then you're, you're an idiot. Okay. <laughs> so the construction lender, because he's first paid, does he get any profit in the deal? Does he get a profit participation? I sold it for, I remember I made $18 million or $60 million. Does he get any of it? Yeah. No, why? Because he's the first guy. He takes the least risk. He gets nothing. He just gets his 4 to 8%. Okay. The Mez guy and the preferred equity, they just have different percentages. The JV guys who take the most risk, they get a piece of the deal, a piece of the profit. So I get some of the profit and the JV guy gets some of the profit. Okay. So they, they are profit participators. Everyone else on the stack is typically not a profit participator. It's just lend money at an interest rate. Okay. So you say, how, is this, how does this relate to me? Very simple. Let's say that you right now want to go buy a duplex somewhere in Westchester. You go to all your friends and family and say, hey, it cost a million dollars. I'm going to live in one. I'm going to rent out the other. I'm going to fix it up. I'm going to sell it for a million free. There's $300,000 in profit. Would you invest with me? Would you give me money to realize that 30% gain? Well, yeah, I want to make 18% of my money over three, over whatever period of time or you know, short, relatively three to five year period of time. So I have to give them some of the profit and I get some of the profit, right? So I don't, unless I wrote the check myself, I have to share that profit, okay? All right, let's move on. All right, the whole return model, bank and constructors takes the least risk, gets paid interest rate, the mezzanines take more, the joint venture partner, all the doctors and guys that are in my fund, my 51 investors, they all get a piece of the deal. They're getting 50% of the profit in my deal. I raise $11 million. I said, hey, I'm building for $40 million. I'm selling for $15 or $60 million. I get $8 million. You get $8 million, Right? So that's that's the idea. Now, that $8 million they got on their $60 million is a 50% return. If it took three years to make 50%, what was their annualized return? So it's 50 divided by three. 16%, 16%. They made 16% in their investment over a three-year period. Now, is every deal they get 50%? No, it's whatever you can negotiate in life. Okay, depending on who you are, how many times you've done it, et cetera. Okay, now, typically we go out, we raise money. We raise, so if I needed 5 million of equity, I typically put in 500,000 and I go raise four and a half million dollars. Okay, so I leverage my return because I do all the work. Investor just invest. So everyone says, why in the world do you get all this debt? Okay. Why do I get debt? Because leverage returns are greater. So let's look at this. Remember my six and a half percent return on my example, right? If I wrote a check for $40 million, I'm making six and a half percent return on my money. Right? Get my two million six. Lock in it. Thank you very much. Everyone's happy. Blah, blah, blah. However, if I went leverage 65%, and got a $26 million loan, and that bank charged me 4%, right? I don't have to put up 14 million of equity, not 40 million, right? Instead of 40 million, I only put up 14. Well, I have 2 million six of cash flow. I have to pay the bank 4% of the 26 million, right? Pay them their debt, it's debt service due every year. I gotta pay them 4%. So I have to pay them out of the 2.6, right? Because the 2.6 is just the operating income of the property. So I'm making a million five, but I put up $14 million. So a million five divided by 14 million is 11.2%. I just leveraged a return from six and a half to 11%. So would I rather do one $40 million deal or stick $14 million in three deals? That's the smarter thing to do. If you had the exact same numbers, you with me on that? I know it's a little confusing, but that's why we leverage. That's why someone buys something at a four cap because they leverage it into an eight percent return, and they could do more deals. I could take I could take fourteen million, do three deals versus take forty million, and I have a better return. Okay, so in the capital markets world, the finance world, this is what we do all day. Now, let's look at what let's look at what I have to give up. I need forty million dollars. I went to Bank of America. Sandy gave me twenty six million dollars. I need fourteen million dollars of equity. Now, let's say I have fourteen million dollars of equity. Okay, would I want to put it all in one deal? 
let's say that's all I had was $14 million. I could do one deal. I would have made 11% return on my money, just click it along, right? Great cash flow. However, I go to an investor and I say, would you give me 12 million of that? And I'll put up a million four. Is there a point here? No point. Well, I'm gonna do this. So of the 14 million, I'll put up 10% or a million four. And I'll go get 12 million from all those high net worth investors. What did I promise them? I said, you know what? I'm gonna pay you an 8% return on your money. And after you've earned an 8% return, we'll split profits 50. Oh, can't even see that. This says 50 50. 50 50. Okay. So after you've earned a, a minimum return of 8%, I get half the profits after that, and you get half the profits after that. Okay. So we call that a preferred return. Now, I get 8% on my million four, too, right? Because my money's just as green as their money. So we both get 8%, and then we split 50 50. Okay. Just like if you. Just like if you did a movie, right? I did a Tom Cruise movie, cost me hundred million to make. I had to go get financing. The finance people want to return on their money. They take a certain percent of the profit of the deal. Same concept, okay? So the deal, I buy 65%. I didn't get any preferred equity. It's too complicated for this seminar. Um, the JV, I got all those guys to put up 90%. I raised $12 million and put a million four. Instead of putting $14 million in, how did, what's that? Sorry, I just thought oh. it was Okay. So remember, someone was willing to buy it for a four and a half cap, right? So they were willing to make $58 million. Got to pay the broker, all the closing costs. That's the million seven. Closing costs are title and escrow and all those things. Now I have $56 million. Who gets paid first? The bank. I got to take 56 and pay the debt off, 26 million. What's that for 26 million? I got 30 million bucks. I got to pay the equity back. So I get my guys back their 12 million, I get back my million four, right? Back my million four, okay? Now there's $60 million. Now remember, I, get, I promised them an 8% return before I got any profit on my deal. So if I took $12 million times 8% times three years, right? Everyone got that? $12 million times 8% times three years. That's an 8% annualized return. Because if let's say it took three years to build it, three years to sleep or three years to build it, he's hit and sell. Okay. So they get they get three million. I get I get three hundred and thirty six thousand because that's eight percent of my money for three years. There's profit left, twelve million dollars of profit. We split 50 50. Remember? That was my deal. Why do we split 50 50 and not 90 10? If I was an investor, I said Mr. Investor, please give me twelve million dollars. I'll give you a 50-50 split and I'm putting up 10% of the money. The guy they go, what? Why Why do they do that? Because they're taking way more risk above, like you can earn a percent of the stock market but you're taking way less risk. You don't need the big return to account for that, right? Correct. I'm taking more risk. What risk am I doing? I have to build the building. Trust me, that's risky. I sign on that debt. I sign an obligation to repay that debt. They don't. I sign, come after my house if I don't pay you back that $26 million. That's called recourse financing. I take market risk. We take, they take market risk. Well, we take all that fluctuation. What's the collateral for the, for the project? Collateral is like, what's the, you know, I have something that if something goes bad, I get that collateral. So they put up the car, the car. Put up their daughter, their son, what do they put up? The project. They put up the property. The property is the collateral. So if, if I don't pay the bank back, what does the bank do? The bank forecloses. Now they're the owner. I've, I've been wiped out of my $14 million. They sell the property and they get their money back. It's the collateral. You get a car loan. You don't pay your car loan. The guy comes and repos your car. That was the collateral for your car loan. This is the collateral for the property. Yeah. So for the 8% to the JV, uh, return over three years. Are we compounding that or is it just times like a simple times three? We generally compound it, but for the sake of this argument here for this class, I just did three of us. But we always, we typically always compound because you lose, you're not really making 8% of your, right? All right. So how much did I make? Well, well let's see. Okay. So 58 million, 50 50 split. What did I make? Or what did the, what did the GV make? He made what? Missing points. No, that's fine. That's fine. 
Remember the 12 million nine of profit from the last page? We split 50-50. So he gets he gets that 8% return, which is the $3 million plus the $6 million. So he put up, or the develop, they put up 12 million six and they made 9 million four. 8% plus 50%, right? 8% plus 50% of the month of profits. They made 9 million four on their investments. I wrote a check for $12 million. I got my 12 million back plus $9 million, right? So I made $20 million. Good day work, right? So I take the 9 million. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to write it here because it. Here, we'll take four seconds. I no, got that's it. right. You I'm sure? just going to write it there. All right. Thank you anyway. Yeah. So I take 9 million four, 74. And I divide that by how much money I put in. I put in 12 million six. So let me do that math. What does that equal? That's my profit, right? I put nine, I put 12 million and made nine. What percent was my profit? Someone's got to do it. 75.2. What is it? 75.2. 75.2%. 75.2%. I made 75% of my money. But out 12, got nine back. 12 plus nine back. I mean, 75. How long did it take me to get that money back? Three years. So I take that divided by three. My annualized return is about 25%. I made a 25% return on my money. So what I do in the business, I put a big book together. I say, hey, I'm building in Culver City, 54 units. It's going to generate this NOI of blank. I go to the bank. I get Sandy to make a loan. I go, Mr. I'm projecting that you're going to make a 25% annualized return over a three-year period. Do you want to invest? And we do that again and again and again and again. So all of those things that we talked about, all those investment return hurdles, right, of the stock market. What does the stock market earn on average? Six, seven percent and highly volatile. This is more volatile, way more volatile, but we leverage our return. So one said, hey, could you buy this at a four and a half cap? Well, I put debt on it. Now I'm making an eight percent annualized cash return. And if I sell it, I make it a 25 percent return. That's what investors want in real estate because it's risky. Because it rains, because companies move out of Detroit, and value of property, because you can't lease it, it goes to zero. Value in, value in Detroit for 10 years, the value of property was zero. There was no employment. We take all of those volatile risks, so everyone needs to make a good return on their money. Now, some people go, yeah, I don't like Culver City. I don't like apartments. It's kind of a hassle. Uh, I'm out. And they say no, even with this return. It's a good return, right? So this was the return of the deal we did in Denver, but we made them a 25% return. Now, what did I make? I'm the developer. What did I make? Oh, I'm so happy. Now, I got six and a half million. That was my 50%, right? Plus what? I got something else there. What else did I get? Got my six and a half, which was half the money, plus my 8%. What's my 8%? 336,000. Plus my six and a half million, I made six point seven million dollars. Can't write it anymore. It's Friday. We should do this drinking beer. Okay, I made six point seven million dollars. How much money did I put up? Remember my ninety ten? How much money did I put up? It was fourteen million dollars. I put up just up there. I put up a million four, right? Ah. I do the exact same math. What is my annualized return? Or what's my return? First of all, what's my return? I say you the time, but if you divide those two, you can get 585% return on my money. This is why we develop. But we take massive risk. Okay? I take the risk that they make 25. They 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 trust me. They pay me very well. Now remember, I take a lot of risk. Therefore, I garner the greatest return. Okay. Now, the guys and investors, they negotiate left and right. Left. Oh, and you can't have 50. I'll give you 20. I'll give you 30. And we negotiate. Every single deal is a different deal. Okay. I just did that for the sake of argument. So I made a gross multiple of 5.8% of my money or 586%. 
I divide that by three, I make really good money, right? Okay, now, the developer, now this is the tricky part, right? The trickiest part of the real thing. Does everyone go, fun? What I do for a living is I promote the construction of real estate. I'm promoting. Right? My money earns the same re should earn the same return as an investor. It's green, they're green. The difference between a 25% return on my money and what I actually got in total is my promoter's fee or my promote for taking all this risk. So the way you figure that out is you say, I'm gonna take a million four. Remember, I put up a million four. What did the investor make? What do you make on his money? Right there. What do you make? Annualized return. 25%. So my money is just as green as his. So 20, if I made 25% for three years on my money, okay, that's a million dollars. Okay. It's a million dollar fifty plus. Up. I made a million fifty on my money. That's a 25% return on my million four. How much did I make in total? Remember my 50% plus my 300,000 I made? $6.7 million, right? So if I take $6.7 million and I subtract out the 25%, the difference is my promote or $5 million, $7 million, $5.7 million, okay? Simple, I'm, I'm rounding here. So I still get a 25% return on money, but I make $5 million for doing all the work to make the movie, to take the risk. Okay, that's how that's how we as developers make money. We do promotes. So let's go back to the previous thing. If I have forty million dollars, would I put my forty million dollars in this deal and make a six and a half percent return, or would I put one point four million in twenty deals or fifteen deals and make five times my money? So if I had forty million dollars, I would turn forty million dollars into two hundred million dollars. Versus turn forty million dollars into sixteen million dollars profit. That's the beauty of leveraging in capital markets. Okay, that is how that's how ninety eight percent of businesses work, but in real estate, that's especially how it works. Okay, but we take a lot of risk. So everyone understand the just basic concept here. I borrow money. That's the capital market structure market. What it is, how it works. Okay. If you take my development class, which we have some students who have and are doing it now, we go over this in detail and you actually run an actual property. We actually go through an actual property in my class that I own, we're about to start construction, you make value. So what ends up happening is they, they're gonna make an offer on the land, I give them hard and soft costs, they have to go out and underwrite the market, they go do all that kind of stuff. Some, some people are laughing because they're going, man, that was, that was a lot of work, but it's fun. At the end of the day, you have an investment package that you can take to investors. So if you ever are in this business, if you're ever in this business, you get that opportunity. Think you guys know what to do with this? Any questions or comments? Any things you're confused about? I'm letting you out early. I talked quicker as usual, but I'm letting you out early because it's Friday and it's happy hour somewhere. <laughs> or I can keep talking. I can... Talk about 600 examples of what's happened. Okay, yeah, big round of applause. So a few things um, as you're doing this. Um, whoops. Oh, is this for me? It's for you. Oh, yay. Oh, thank you. Um, so a few things. I'm the chairman of the Real Estate Advisory Council. Um, we are, uh, and Chris here is the president of the Real Estate Society. Um, if you are interested in real estate, I suggest three things here at LMU. One, join the society. Two, go to the events that he mentioned. Three, take my class. Okay, if you're interested, if you're not interested, you don't have to go, I'll tell you personally. But the idea is that you will you will have a, and, and get the certificate like you're doing. Those are the four things you can do. Go to the networking sessions. The networking session will have 20 guys like me all in the business, the Santee Patels, the Mies, everybody who's been in the business. This is a networking business. You must shake hands, say hello. This is not a hide behind computer business. I don't care what you do in this business. It's not hiding behind computers approach. 
Okay, this business is being out in the world. So networking is great. So those would be the four things to do if you're interested. Uh, we we as a, a council have been trying to, we as a council have been trying to uh, get a full-time real estate program here where you can major or minor in real estate and where we'd have construction management, um, architecture, things of that nature. They could You could have a well-rounded education. But the classes here, I, how many choices they have now? No, I mean the, the classes uh, and the certificate. Well, there's 12 different seminars to take. You only have to take six to get the certificate. I think mine and two others are mandatory. Um, but the other ones, you, there's there's stuff on architecture, there's stuff on law, there's stuff on 1031 tax exchange. There's all kinds of things that you, you get. And I will tell you that people who have done those four things here and wanted to be in real estate, we got them jobs in real estate, which is really what the whole point of this is. If you're interested in this business, we will help you. Okay. Anthony um, Walker is in charge of our mentorship program. If you're interested in being mentored by someone like us, they will put you, he will put you in charge uh, or put you in contact with a mentor. If you're interested networking, it's great. They'll take you to events, you know, things of that nature. Um, it's a great way to get uh, inundated. Um, if you don't do anything in real estate, you have a living somewhere else and you want to invest in real estate. This is a real good thing to understand. If someone's asking you for money, you'll say, what's your promote? What's the return? What's the risk? What phase are we in? Those kinds of things, even if you're not doing real estate as a career. Okay. All right. Sick of me talking? Yeah. The, the equation for cap rate, NOI divided by the value of the building is the cap rate. That's the rate of return. And again, I think you guys get a copy of this, right? You get a copy of this, so it's in there. So value of a piece of property is it's NOI divided by the cap rate. The cap rate is defined as the unleveraged rate of return someone's willing to pay for that property. Just a rate of return. Okay. Anybody have questions real estate in general or anything of that nature? What uh, books do you recommend for people to like get to real estate and on their own personal? Well, that's a great question. So there's an organization out there called the ULI, Urban Lane Institute. Okay. It's an organization that a lot of us belong to. It's you join it or not join it. There's a great um there's a great college ULI program. Uh, you go out to ULI, Urban Lane Institute, look up the, you can find the college stuff. They have all kinds of uh, mentorships and internships there as well. Um, and then they, Urban Lane Institute publishes, there must be over a thousand different real estate books from everything from construction management to accounting and real estate to development to uh, the, the book in my, my class is called The Five Principles of Real Estate, or Five Principles of Real Estate Development. Um, it's a great book. Um, it, it still will put you to sleep. If you can't sleep at night, you start reading it before I sleep. Okay. But it's not a bad book. I only went through like a hundred books to pick that one. Um, but in at it, Urban Institute, there's hundreds of publications. And if like, hey, I like retail, there's a hundred books on retail. Hey, I like a pharmacist, there's a hundred books on pharmacy. Hey, if you like it, it's a great resource uh, for that. Okay. So let me ask. So if you're you're working as someone like any of us who's just new in the business or something, company like Aries Capital or something like that. If you're working there, is that modeling pretty much what you do? That's what you start doing. That's what you start. Yep. Right. That's what you do 14 hours a day. Right. And then you you ask questions. So by the way, I just had a meeting with Aries. Um, we're trying to finance our $200 million Encino senior living deal. They're going to do the equity. We hope they're going to do the equity. We hope they're going to do the equity. They're going to put up $50 million of equity in our deal. Okay, so I have people who are in there anywhere from 23 to 33 as the analysts there, and they're asking me all the questions. They're asking me everything that I just said up there. What's the demand for senior in that marketplace? What's the supply of demands in that marketplace? Uh, what's your bank loan going to be? Uh, we have to be in and out in five years. We have to build it and sell it in five years. Yeah, everything that we just went through, we run all that for areas and we get them an, an IRR or a return, an annualized return on their money. They go to their committee to make a decision and then decide whether to invest. So young people in their 20s to 30s um, do most of that work. 
you know, it's a great place to learn. It's great, it's, I, I don't know. And especially if you never want to sleep, there's, there's better places. I used to work. Do you, uh, do you think, is there like a senior similarly coming kind of that you think they're getting rid of investors going to start building a lot of perspectives you're building? Seniors? Um, yes. There is a tsunami of older people that are coming. Um, uh, just everyone's living longer. Um, I have a great chart that I did in my class, if anyone remembers. That had the, there was the demographic age of 20 to 34 year old and the demographic age of 70 and above. Mm -hmm. And it was growing five times as fast. Um, and so that's just a, that's a simple demographic in a real estate market. It's a cell phase. They'll say, I think I should be building senior. So we started building senior. It was really that simple. It's not a magic to it. You just look for trends. What should I be building? Is your end of the business looking into? Looking into again uh, commercial real estate on the small space, converting it into residential. Yeah, too hard to do. It's yeah, too expensive to do. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. And I'll, I'll tell you why. It's, you know, we, we looked at. I think we've looked at more than thirty buildings in the Right here in our side. Okay, here's the problem with here's the problem with a uh, an office building. You have a square office building, right? You have elevators that sit in the middle, okay? A normal apartment building, a high-rise apartment building, because most of you live a mid or high-rise uh, office building. The depth of an apartment building is only about 21 feet, okay? So you don't have everything in the back, right? Every 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 part of, the, of your residential unit needs to have light. That is not the case in office buildings. Office buildings, an office building, this is 60 feet deep. So the problem is you have wasted almost 30, 40 feet that is dark, has no windows. So what ends up happening, you take an office building, you get this apartment building and it blows. It's not efficient and it's expensive and it doesn't work, right? Because somehow this part of this, this poor bedroom that sits back here has to have some place. <laughs> So that's the problem with building. Most apartment high rises they're built this way, 24, 21, 24. So it's almost like you have 